All right, folks, we are live on the show. This is awesome. Sorry, just getting set up here. Thank you very much to everybody for joining. My name is Eric Wright. This is going to be your Thursday edition of Turbonomic Labs. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some open technology. And there was a, a very specific use case that I had that I was tackling recently. And I thought no better place than to share that uh, with folks because there's a lot of good learnings we can capture from the way in which I got to it. Even if you take the technology aside, uh, this is really uh, very much about the practice of using infrastructure as code and being able to do something where I can quickly spin up and tear down. So I've actually got a, literally a quick presentation just to lead into exactly why I did this. Uh, but I do have to give a shout out, of course. Thank you. If you are watching this live, you can drop in a chat uh, on whatever platform you're on. We are broadcasting right now on Periscope. We are on YouTube. We're on LinkedIn Live. We're all over the place. Uh, so wherever you chat from, if you uh, if you send a message, that'll come right through if you've got any questions on the sh during the show. If you, of course, are watching us on replay, which many folks do, uh, please do uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel because that's a great way for us to Make sure that we're doing the right thing and you can keep it in keep in touch with us and you learn kind of what's going on as we we put new things up. You can hit the little bell icon and then you can find out uh, when new episodes publish because we're doing pretty much every other week. Right now, we're going to be doing both every Tuesday. It's turbonomic focused content. Uh, so we want to really get into like practitioner, how to use the stuff. So we're doing some really cool things. Uh, and that could be anything from Turbonomic to Turbonomic Data Clouds to the Park My Cloud, uh, Sev1. We're going to do more stuff with that and all of our partners. Uh, and we've got a lot of great things that we're doing on the channel. Then Thursdays are all about doing open technology and, and open ecosystems or just generally, you know, anything. And I wanted to focus on today, we're going to be using a few different pieces of tech. And with that... We'll jump right in. Of course, a big shout out to uh, our production and direction crew here. So we got Elizabeth Sheehan, the true best voice of the uh, of the broadcast that we never get to hear. Uh, but thank you, Elizabeth, as well as if you're here on Tuesdays, it's usually Navi. Navi also one of the unsung heroes that's behind our entire digital marketing that makes this a fantastic company even better every day. So let's talk about the HashiCorp Nomad Lab with AWS and Terraform. I want to give the context as to why the heck would you do this thing? And, and that's the first thing you should ask in general. When we're about to do some neat technology stuff, I like to stop with the sort of Simon Sinek. Start with why. And it really is the idea of, of why would I need to do this and, and why does it matter uh, that it was being done? So thinking about what it was that I personally needed to solve, uh, I'm using Nomad, uh, which is a great uh, workload and container orchestration platform. Uh, it's from the HashiCorp ecosystem. Uh, I actually have a Pluralsight course on it. So obviously I've, I'm a bit more uh, involved with it because I've, I've been coaching a lot of people on how to use it. And what I needed to be able to do was to have a Nomad lab so I could really quickly spin up stuff for shared testing. So I've got a local version that I use with Vagrant and VirtualBox, uh, which is great, but it doesn't allow me to share it with other people. Or, you know, what if I wanted to be able to do collaborative work in general, or even better, to spin up something that's a little bit more scalable. So I need to be able to spin it up and tear it down easily. The last thing I need to do is to have more stuff that I'm having to remember to turn on and shut off. And when you're running stuff on the cloud, of course, uh, the old taxi ticker keeps on ticking while you're not looking. Uh, and I needed to be scalable because today my use case for basic functional testing is, is I want a three node lab. So I can understand how communication works between different networks, between the different nodes, when I'm doing scheduling of resources, how does it work? How do I actually put jobs into the queue? And how do they behave when I do stuff like node movement and, and shutdown? However, what if I wanted to go to five and seven and nine and 12 and 28? Well, if I'm doing that on my local machine, I can't possibly spin up that many. So the cloud is an obvious place where it's, it's handy to be able to go. And more than that, I also said, hey, if I'm doing this and I need to solve this problem, I'm probably not the only one who's got this problem. So I'm going to open source it and share it with folks so that they can learn about all three of these pieces of the ecosystem from the AWS to the Terraform, as well as to the actual Nomad site itself. 
So the funny thing is what you're going to see is very little to do with Nomad. That just happens to be the target. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is using code. So the thing about sharing stuff in code, that means that if for whatever reason I stop working on it, uh, someone else can pick it up or maybe they can learn from it. So we've got a public facing GitHub repository that I, I have under my GitHub. I've got a link to it in a second, but if you just go to github.com forward slash disco posse, you can find all of my code there. It's called the Nomad AWS Mini Lab. And so I've made sure to put it up there so that in case I uh, stop working on it and someone else wants to pick it up, they can do so, uh, or if they want to be able to learn from it. The other reason why I wanted to do it in this way was running locally is fantastic for me, uh, but it's not good for my team. And even more so with my team, we've come in time to get better at doing things like managing secrets and managing configuration in a more sort of 12 factor methodology. So security, when you're getting into this is, is handy because I want to be able to have my team and, and my peers use this Nomad Lab, but I don't want them to have to be using my keys or giving them accounts on AWS. So I'm going to use Terraform Cloud to provision and manage it because it's free and I'm free. I like free. Like, I, do I need to say it's free again? It's free. It's really cool because I don't want to have to pay for it. And I don't want people who I'm say teaching have to pick up the bill for something just so that they can figure it out. The other piece is I'm sharing the code on GitHub. So if somebody else wants to just grab it, they can fork the repository, connect it up to their own uh, Terraform cloud, and then they're off and running and they can customize it uh, ad infinitum if they would like. Uh, and then the important thing, as I mentioned at the start is I shouldn't be managing accounts for people. So I'm going to use my own specific IAM credentials that I've defined for my Terraform uh, cloud configuration. I'll set it up for my project. I store it in secrets inside Terraform cloud, which I'll show you what, how we do it. And then from that point on, if I need to cancel it, change it, update it, which I do. Uh, so I roll over my, my IAM keys all the time. And, and so this way I can change it. No one needs to be aware of that I'm making that change. And it also means I don't leak out my key by putting it into the code somewhere. So it's handy to, to help you with that. And then the next piece was, hey, wait a second. I, I th thought there was a reference architecture, a quick start. True. There is, in fact, a quick start for running Nomad on AWS. And as you'll find with many of the quick starts, uh, when it comes to the way that they, the, a vendor will share their quick start implementation on, on AWS using CloudFormation, is it's, uh, it, it's a little more than you're bargaining for, generally. So I, I looked at the configuration. I thought, good golly, I'm not trying to build a, a hardcore system here. I, I don't need to be hardened with bastion hosts and spread across availability zones with multiple nodes for the servers and the client nodes. I wanted a similar sort of spread, but I wanted to simplify it a lot more. So rather than having to have you look and just right here, if you think about it, we're looking at nine uh, compute instances just for the console nomad and, uh, and the client side and the server side. Plus you're looking at three gateways, plus you're looking at a Bastion host. So the, the charges kick up pretty quickly. As I mentioned, did I say free, right? So this isn't free, this is far from free. While AWS charges, even in this little mini lab I'm gonna show you is not free, it's a lot closer to free. So this is more my jam. This is where I get into things. I'm like, all right, what if I could do a much more simplified deployment now, how do we actually figure this up? Well, first of all, uh, I need a cloud. Check, problem solved. AWS made my life easy that way. I need a region. Uh, check, uh, there's lots of them. The stuff that we're gonna use, the services are available in every possible region. Uh, I'm using mine in US East too, because as you can tell by my crazy microphone, I'm a fan of radio. So I'm gonna put it right next to old WKRP in Cincinnati. Then, we're going to configure everything from here down is now brand new and is deployed automatically using code. So I'm going to spin up a VPC because I want to have my own dedicated VPC for isolation and so that I know it's not going to be confused with other VPCs in my environment. And I don't want to put it in the default VPC. I'm going to 
create my different subnets across that VPC in one region. So I'm gonna have one, two, three different subnets that I'm gonna configure. I'm going to have them spread across three different availability zones. So they're gonna be on three different distinct networks. And then I'm gonna deploy three different EC2 nodes into them where each will run console, nomad server, nomad client. So I'll have all three of the, of the endpoints running, but on one single node in each environment. I need a security group, of course, to speak so that it can get out there and, and speak to the earth. And then I'm going to create an internet gateway so that I can have an egress and an ingress, which is kind of necessary because you need to be able to get to the Docker repository to be able to pull down containers and such. And then the other thing, which is kind of fun in the code is I've actually got to spin up and create a routing table so that I can have my gateway speak to the rest of the world. When you're doing this through the wizards, you're actually doing this and it builds it for you. And if you watch, we did a Turbonomic Labs on how to set up a VPC from the ground up and you saw some of the steps that it takes. So I thought, why not get rid of those steps and do it all in code? With that, let's talk about doing it on a budget. So I had to solve two specific problems and we're gonna show you exactly how we did it. Number one, how do I do it on a budget? Number two, how do I do it on demand? So that at any point in time, I can spin this up and tear it down. And uh, without further ado, uh, no more presentations needed. Let's just jump right in and, and see what it actually looks like. Oh yeah, by the way, of course, uh, if you wanted to get, like I said, you go to github.com forward slash disco posse and it's the Nomad AWS Mini Lab. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll put that in show notes if we can, wherever we can, but of course you can always go there. And actually, if you're watching this from the GitHub, because it's inception, I'm gonna take this recording and put it into the readme so you can see uh, what's going on and how to do it. So with that, let's get out of there. No more presentations required. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna do the classic thing. This is the, as every magician should, I'm gonna show you that there's nothing up my sleeves. As you can see, uh, there's no VPCs. Uh, so I actually have, uh, in this case, I've got one VPC, which is default. So there's nothing special there. Uh, I've got my EC2 environment, which I have no running EC2 instances. It's completely clean. So this was gonna show you the, the speed and ease with which we're going to do this. I've got my code repository. We'll jump into the code momentarily, but first let's kick it off so we can get things started. So in my Terraform configuration, I'm gonna go, I've got my Terraform cloud. Like I said, it's free. I think we're up to 10 users, something like that. Uh, we're gonna say Terabonomic Labs. So it's gonna start things up and then we're gonna go and I don't even need to do the pre-baked oven. It's, it's actually so quick. That, that it'll take it. It's going to initialize in the back end. So what I've got in the readme for the code repository, you're, you can actually see, we'll just zoom in a bit here, so it's a little easier. Uh, the lab is gonna set up a brand new VPC, uh, create three subnets, create the security group with ingress and egress rules for SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, and all the nomad and console ports that are necessary creates my internet gateway, uh, my routing table and my subnets. And then I'm gonna put my three EC2 instances. You can, you can muck around with the, the scaling of this. Some of the stuff is buried in the, in the code a little bit. Um, so like I'm setting, if you go over four, then you're, it kind of, it isn't really meant to go wide on this one. So this is really meant to be a mini lab, which is why I called it that. So I've talked about why it exists. Uh, you will need IAM credentials, uh, which have the ability to run uh, in EC2 and a couple of other places. So it's important that you go, oh, look at that. I just got my uh, notification from uh, Slack that my Terraform has applied. Uh, I've got notifications for just such an occasion and that's good for collaboration as well. And so once I do that, the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that I've got uh, some variables set. So I'm gonna have my AWS keys that are inside the Terraform project. I'm gonna set the region, uh, my SSH key so I can manage the nodes themselves. I'm gonna choose the instance size. I always set this in a variable because that means if I've got a dynamic uh, change behind the scenes that it can adjust. Uh, and I'm going to then also uh, set my allowed network, which is gonna be where I'm gonna have my ingress ports allowed. 
and the uh, node count. So it's pretty easy. That's There's not much to it. So let's jump right in and take a look. So in my variables, this is the good thing. Like I said, we want to use uh, we want to use the secrets capability inside Terraform Cloud. So let's sort of zoom in a bit there, make it a little easier to read. Uh, so this is a, a sensitive key so that once I write it, uh, I can only write it, no one can read it. And if I need to update, I have to do a new write and that's it. So it's safe for me to share this with my team. Uh, my region, I've said it's EUS East 2. I've got my SSH fingerprint. I've already created my SSH key. It's inside my VPC. I, I'm going to set the T2 small. Uh, it's a small, it's a mini lab. I just need to kick the tires on it. Uh, my node ID, uh, which is the Amazon Linux 2. That's what it's been tested out on. I'm going to set a three node count. And uh, in the list of bad ideas you're going to commit, this is one of them. Uh, I'm actually setting all ports, all inbound. Go for it. Uh, all IPs are allowed in. But because I'm only doing this and I want to share it with other folks, as usually the fastest and easiest way, and I'm going to tear it down at the end. The cool thing, even if you're watching live and you see the IP that I give you, by the time you realize what's going on, uh, it'll be gone. So it is actually safe. Uh, there's one neat little trick, which I'm gonna, I should blog about. I've set this TF warn output errors, and that's because when I do the run, it's going to output a dynamic uh, URL, which is based on the IP address that it gets and appending the, the HTTPS and all the goodies for my console and for my Nomad web UI. But when it goes to tear it down, because it's computed, and it involves gluing together, concatenating static and dynamic text. For whatever reason, it freaks out and it may stop. And then it stops the destroy of the, so when I wanna get rid of it, it'll fail to get rid of it because it's trying to read an output that doesn't exist. Of course it doesn't exist because the IP doesn't exist. So if you set this warn output errors to one, uh, it means that it only goes to warn and it will let it keep going. Uh, so it's a bit of a safeguard. So we'll take a look at my run here. So I've got my run. We take a look at what the plan did. The plan went through all of the different goodies it's going to need to do. It said, I've got 13 resources to add. Uh, here's, I've set the static IP. You'll see that in the code in a second. And then here's the outputs. So there you go, kids, look at that. In the most non-secure way, go ahead, copy, paste it, copy, paste it, you can see it. We can actually go and we could use those URLs. We'll be back to that in a second. All right, let's jump into the code and see exactly what made this thing work. So the first thing I've got is, of course, I set up my provider, which is AWS. I'm setting the back end as Terraform Cloud so that you're going to see this uh, configured as a, a remote back end. I've got my org name and my workspace name. Very simple. I only need the, the key and the region. Then I've got my, let's start with the VPC. Now Terraform, just a, a word of advice, of course, you, you can do this where you don't need to order it in a particular way. It will always glue all the code together and then process it in line once it validates. I chose in this case to separate my files so that they're logically defined. So this is my VPC stuff is all here. My variables are all here. So I can go through and see all my variables. Uh, so there, that's one way to kind of clean things up visually. There's no right or wrong. It's gonna be completely by preference, which is interesting. So there we go. Let's uh, see what we've got. So we've got VPC, uh, basic VPC configuration. I'm setting default tenancy, so it's a shared uh, environment. I'm allowing for DNS for both host names and support. Uh, I, I tag my stuff, always tag your stuff <clears throat> so that you can easily find it out. Uh, this is very good for you to be able to track things if you're doing it. So I use stuff like Park My Cloud and Turbo, uh, and we actually use tagging in order to identify stuff. You can do it by other means, but tagging is a good way to do it. Now, then I'm going to create my sub, oh, let's see, let's go with security group here. So I've got my VPC, then I'm setting my security group, which is, sorry, I don't mean to scroll so fast. Egress is all out. I wanna be able to have all my internal stuff access everything out in the world. So that's fine. Cause that's for stuff like patches, uh, for getting uh, containers from the registry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then all of these are the different ports which are required. And I'm setting it to use the allowed IP network uh, variable, which is an HCL or HashiCorp configuration language variable over in my, uh, my backend configuration. Now I've got my security group. So I've got my VPC. I'm going to create my subnets. And this is where a cool trick comes in. We'll show you. Uh, I need to create a subnet. So I'm going to use a count. I want three. Uh, so I've decided that three is the magic number. I could technically pull this over. If it was truly dynamic, it would pull it over from the, from the variable. But I've been a little bit more uh, hard-coded in this one. So I'm going to say count to three. And of course, it's zero, one, two. If you're remembering that this is a, uh, we count like developers, not like ops people. Uh, so ops people would be one, two, three. Uh, developers count zero, one, two. That's the way that arrays are identified. So I'm going to say, dot zero dot one dot two and i'm setting the cider uh for my network there so I just zoom in a bit here to do because it's probably a little easier to read there we go so i'm going to set my it's going to be ten dot zero dot zero dot zero then one dot zero then two dot zero uh, so it's easy for you to be able to then have those three different distinct networks and then, of course, I'm saying to allow public IPs because I want them to be able to grab IPs and speak to the rest of the world and be accessible internally. So that's cool. But this is the neat one. So I'm going to say the availability zone is the region. So in this case, it's going to be US East 2. And oh, what's this thing here? It's called var az map. So I'm, I'm taking a map and I'm using the count index. So because if I look at what's a region name, a region name is not US East to zero, it's US East to A. So what I do in my variables is I create a map. And so that maps, and it basically says, take one value and map it to a second value. So if I get a zero, I'm gonna convert it to an A. And I get a one and a B, and so you can see where we're going. So as I'm doing the subnet counting, what's super cool about this now is that my subnets, when I'm creating them, is going to be US East 2. When it's a zero, it'll be A. So I'm automatically distributing across A, B, and C. So I've got my three availability zones. Those three availability zones means I've got my distinct networks and my protection in the case that one availability zone goes away. While rare, it's still better we architect for rare and uh, versus never. So we've got our subnets, we've got our VPC, we've got our security groups, we've got our basic access. Uh, now we need to create the network. What we're gonna do is now is we have to take first an internet, we're gonna create an internet gateway. Once we have the internet gateway, we're going to then create a routing table for it. So I've got my route table. I'm going to take those routes and make sure that it has access to all of the rest of the world. And then what I'm going to do is take those subnets and I'm going to associate the new subnets to my uh, internet gateway in the routing table. And there's two things that are interesting here. Number one is this lifecycle thing. So when you say create before destroy in lifecycle, if you were like standing it up and tearing it down repeatedly, or there's a problem where maybe one of the subnets wasn't available, when you go to delete this code set or like get rid of the project, it will complain if one of these subnets is not associated. So what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to force it to create it, then get rid of it just in case there's an ordering problem. And then the other ordering problem is how do I make sure that I've got my other stuff first? So I have to have my subnets before I can create the subnet associations. And I have to have a routing table before I create that. So that's, uh, that's where those come from, but a handy, handy little tip. And then the last piece we've got here, or second to last in this case, because I've got output two, is my instance itself. So these are my three instances. I'm gonna go by the node count, so I'm going to three. I'm gonna go, I've got it my, my AMI. And then here's the where the, the actual magic happens. Number one, I set the IP address, because I want it to be hard-coded, because I want to be specific on defining it in my shell script. Now, the next piece I've got is how do I install Nomad console and all of the goodies? That's how I do it. It's using user data or cloud in it. When you run cloud in it, the reason why this is handy is you only do it on instantiation of the node. So if I were to run this and 
deploy my three nodes, but then say I change the instance type, it would go back to my code and it would try to rerun stuff again. But because it's already been created, there's no more cloud in it. So I don't have to worry about running my install script again and blowing things up. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, maybe it's a poor man's configuration management method, but it does work in this case where it will only run on first launch. And then the outputs is that I'm going to grab just the IP addresses on the private side, the public IPs. And of course, I'm creating my URLs, which is just taking the HTTP, putting it on my node name. And I've only put one in there. You could technically do it for all three. Uh, and then, of course, the actual port and the, and the UI. So this way, when I go back to my outputs, then I end up with this. And let's just see if it works. So I'll start this up while we're going. Oh, look at that. We've got console. And what else do we have? We've got Nomad. So the funny thing is it's actually, I guess it's a console lab as well and not just Nomad. So if you wanted to try this out and it's a pennies on the dollar compared to what it would cost you to run the reference architecture. So my Nomad, I have three clients. I've got three servers. Now, remember, server and client, if you're into the Nomad thing, these are endpoints within the same node, uh, but a, uh, a server is what actually does the sketch, does the, the processing, and the client is what does the assignment and the allocations. Uh, then on the console side, I've got my three uh, Nomads that are registered here in console, and of course, I've got my three console nodes. Pretty cool. So now if I wanted to like fail a node and try different stuff out, then I can easily do it, which is very, very cool. Uh, if I look at my VPC, there we go. So I've got my Nomad Lab VPC. I can see inside here. So I've got my VPC. I've got my routing table. So all of the stuff that I've done is done dynamically. Uh, I actually should name it, so, so there you go. It's a good point. Uh, if you think about that, it's always good, if you can, to uh, to make sure that you're assigning your routes. And then I've got my instances, but I refresh here. There's my zero, one, and two. And if I wanted to go in and, and check it out, again, I've got my tags. So all my stuff is, is tagged. It has the name, of course. It has that it's, I'm going to manage it with Turbo. Uh, it's provisioned by my, I call everything in Project Terra. And it's Terraform. So if I look in other tools, I want to say, hey, is this Terraform managed? I can use that as a marker. And if I want to then connect to it, I deployed my SSH. There we go. So I can now run my different tools on here. So I can see, look at that. So now I have command line access that I can share if other people have the SSH key. Uh, but if I just wanted them to kick the tires on stuff, they've got the web UI. We've got everything here. Uh, and then, oh, right. Remember there was that one case where why do we store certain things in variables? Well, imagine that now I've got my node size and I say, you know what? I think I want a, I want a bigger boat. I want to kick things up a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to run a few more jobs. So I can just switch this to medium and we'll save that. And in a second, we're going to kick things off. But first, one more thing before we get into this. So my configuration for as well for the install Let's just run, run through. I want to make sure that we're all set. So it's going to run all the configuration. And this is the install for the cloud in it. You can go through the code. I'm not going to leave through it here because that's not valuable or, or easy to look at. I've got my server configurations for console. I've got my Nomad configuration. So this is the HCL file, which gets copied locally and used. As you can see, it's going to look for whatever the IP address it gets internally. Uh, I'm setting in this case, I should probably be a little bit better and dynamically build this file with the IP addresses that I get, uh, but it's easier in this case because we have a bit of a cart horse problem. You don't get the IP address, which you would need to then run the cloud in it until it's started up. So it's there's a little bit of, this is why the mini lab is handy because it is mini. 
And uh, so I've got those configured and I even included a couple of jobs. So let's just take a, let's take a job here and we'll kick one off just to make sure that it works. So I go into my nomad, I'm gonna say run job. Now, uh, as you look through the code on this, sorry, we're, we're going a little bit fast in this portion, but I just wanna be able to show you. Uh, so you'll notice in the job definition, the job spec itself, I've assigned a region and a data center. Now this is coming from my, oh goodness gracious, where did it go? It's coming from my configuration file. Oh, that's why. Sorry, look in the code, look in the code. Uh, so in my console configuration, I set the data center. In my Nomad, same thing. I'm setting a data center or a data center, depending on where you're from, uh, and my region or region, wherever you're from. Uh, region AWS one, so I'm defining these here. So when I'm looking at the actual job code, uh, I need to make sure that it matches because sometimes there are specific definitions that you need to set. Okay, so we've got our job, life is good. Say, it looks like we're cool. And I'm gonna say plan. All right, all tasks are safely allocated. Let's run it. Oh, look at that that vigorous circular motion. We are good. We are now alive. So I've got my little hello app running and I can now muck around with uh, Terraform or sorry, with uh, Nomad or console as I want. I can see all my allocations. It's in the process of going. So this is a great way for you to be able to test out other stuff. And then, so there's two use cases as well that we're adding. Number one, what happens if I wanted to change the size of it? Well, remember, we just changed our node size here. So let's see, upgrade. Hank, I need an upgrade. Okay, so we're gonna run this. I've got this configuration set to auto apply. This is your, your personal choice as to whether you wanna do that. I know kind of what I'm after. So, okay, we can see here, it says zero to add, three to change. So because I've already run my cloud in this script, I've already got my console and my nomad there. I don't need to rerun the script because I'm just changing the instance size. So any configuration changes will only stop and start the instances because it's using the same one. But if we were to have destroyed any one of the instances because of a, a configuration that needs to, like if we wanted to change to a different family, then what it would do is when it launches the new one, it will say cloud in it for the new one, and it will, based on the configuration, add it back to the cluster for you. So in this case, it's gonna go through. Uh, let's see, my instances are in the process of restarting. So we can see that, there we go. So I've literally just clicked a button and we're completely dynamic now. So it's gonna take, it'll take a few minutes for it actually run. It's probably slower for it to stop and restart them than it is to actually just create them from scratch. But now what you're able to see is that by doing this, I'm able to easily understand what's going on in my lab. When I'm done, I'm gonna tear it down because here's one of the big reasons. Now I've got a pretty clean environment. I've got my Nomad security group that I, I tagged and I named so that I, I don't lose track of it. It, it. When you create a new VPC, it creates a default for you automatically, but I wanted to have my own specifics so I could say it's managed by Terraform. And the advantage here is that I could have different rules in one security group than the other so that I don't have to worry about propagating throughout. And most importantly, when I'm done, it goes away. So I can tear this down because I know that everybody's guilty here. Like hands up, who's got a security group named launch group 27, right? Because every time you do some, some new thing, you take the default and it creates a brand new launch group every time for it for security. So I, I don't want that to keep happening because I'll forget about them. And then I go to delete it and I can't remember if it's used anymore or I, I see it in my history and it, it just becomes redundant and messy. So let's take a look at our run here. Look at that, it's in the process of applying. So we've got one, two, three. Yeah, complete, number one, number two done. Oh, look at that. We got an error, this is perfect. It's even better when it breaks. 
Okay. So what was the error? Okay, we've got one, two. Oh, look at that. One of our instances didn't come back with an IP address fast enough. How cool is that? See, this is why we do it in code. Okay, zero, one, two. It's still stopping. Okay, cool. So there's a case where it, as we wait for it, it's still trying to tear down. Okay, so this is the very reason why we want to go ahead. So let's run it again. And if it really gets jammed up, then we can always go ahead and we can remove it. So what I'm doing by using code to manage all of this stuff for me is that I know that as I go through, it's going to run the plan. It's going to say, okay, based on what's happening right now, looks like we've got all clear. Oh, look at that. Even in the time while we waited. Okay, node one cleanly stopped. It is set to medium. And so it'll actually, it's going to go ahead and try and spin it up. So we have our IP addresses. So now what I've been able to do is quickly manage it through code. There you go. I got my Slack notifier that uh, we're, we're live. And then let's just say now it's time to shut it all down. So I go through, because I don't want to leave it running and, and incur the charges. I'm going to say nomad-aws-minilab autocorrect. Why do you do that? You destroy. RIP, good friend. We had good times together. It was a great 36 minutes we spent. But with that, it's time to tear down. So now what's going to happen is I look here, it's going to start to start. To, it's doing the plan first, make sure what it needs to shut down. Now it's going to go ahead. Oh, sorry. Why is it slow, slow, slow? Okay, there we go. There's the apply. Welcome to our microwave lifestyle. Like I, it's really fast, but I want it to be faster. Hey, there we go. We're shutting down. So now it's going to shut down. It's going to get rid of my instances. It's going to clean up my routing table. It's going to clean up my subnets. It's going to clean up all my stuff. And it's just that easy. So that is, uh, that is where things go. So I, I'll remind folks again that when you do want to take a look at this, you can go right to the GitHub page. Go to github.com forward slash Disco Posse. Uh, sometimes stuff is under Turbonomic Labs as well. So our EKS lab is under github.com forward slash Turbonomic Labs. Uh, so you can go here. You can fork the repository. And then from there, you can muck around with it as you wish. Uh, and if you want to just clone it and, and kick the tires on it uh, and then keep updating it as I make changes. If we do, then, then you're ready to go. And just like that, from ground up, we've been able to spin up a low cost uh, nomad lab, a, no, a low cost console lab. We're using as many free tools as we can. Uh, you only incur minor charges. Uh, so just so you know, there are charges for your EC2 instances while they're running. There are, we're not using Elastic IP, so there's no IP charges. We are using an internet gateway, which there's a charge while it runs. And that's all. Uh, we, we didn't set anything else up to that it will incur continuous charges. So as soon as you tear it down, you're going only based on the amount of time you've run in your instances. And depending on what you run, if you run a small one, it's literally, it'll cost you, you know, a couple of bucks an hour in order to run a fully functional scale out lab. And it's just that easy. So if you want to find out more about this and, and other good things, please do come on back. Uh, we are uh, go to turbonomic.com forward slash labs, click on the office on our office hours on demand, and you can see upcoming shows. We can see other stuff that's going on in our ecosystem. And if you have any show ideas or you want to be a part of it, if you've got some really cool open technology or some orchestration or automation or things that you want to show off, we are always happy. So you want to just reach out there, Follow this guy. Just go and, and contact me there. Uh, so I'm at Disco Posse on Twitter. Uh, it's eric.right at turbonomic.com. You can drop me a line and we'll bring you on the show because one of the greatest things about being open is that we are open to give you a voice and a place in which you can show off really cool tools and technologies and, and ideas that you've got. 
And especially if we can do something like this, where you can take this code and I can reuse it and revamp it, you'll notice a lot of the code looks familiar if you watch the most recent episode, which was around standing up a fully automated EKS lab on AWS using Terraform Cloud. So sounds to me like we've got a pretty cool reusable template that if I wanted to, this doesn't need to be Nomad. It could be anything, it could be Apache, it could be Nginx, it could be you name it, LAMP stack, RAMP stack, I stack, U stack, pancake stack, whatever it is, we can do it and you can do it with code. So you can spin it up, tear it down super quick and on the cheap. So with that, thank you to all the folks who are watching live and thank you for the great comments. Thank you to everybody who's been uh, keeping in touch with us as we go and we'll see you on the next show.